Today everyone, I am Richie Shane Sampani and together with Rajan Evangelio, we're going to talk about Maclurian Costas, Five Factor Tray Theory. So here we have a diagram of the Five Factor Tray Theory. We have openness to experience, consensuousness, extroversion, agreeableness, neuroticism, all of which are surrounding personality. Now let us have an overview of trait and factor theories. Well, during the past 25 to 45 years, several individuals like Cattell and Ising and several teams of researchers like Costa and McRae have taken a factor analytic approach to presently. Most researchers who study personality traits agree that five and only five and no fewer than five dominant traits continue to emerge from factor analytic techniques. For us, Many contemporary theorists believe that 5 is a magic number, but earlier theorists such as Raymond B. Cattell found many more personality traits, and Hansel J. Ising insisted that only three major factors can be di discerned by a factor analytic approach. In addition, we have seen that Gordon Alport's common sense approach yielded 5 to 10 traits that are central to each person's life. However, Alport's major contribution to trait theory may have been his identification of nearly 18,000 trait names in an unbridged English language dictionary, and these trait names were the basis for Cattell's original work, and they continue to provide a foundation for recent factor analytic studies. Ising's factor analytic technique yielded three general bipolar factors or types the extroversion or introversion, the neuroticism or stability, and the psychoticism and the superego. The five-factor theory, or the often called the big five, includes neuroticism and extroversion, but it adds openness to experience, agreeableness, and conscientiousness. These terms differ slightly from research team to research team, but the underlying traits are quite similar. Before we talk about McCurry and Costa's five-factor trait theory, let's get to know the person who indirectly influenced their theory. Raymond Cattell is a psychologist known for his 16-factor personality model. Together with his colleagues, he utilized factor analysis to identify 16 different components of personality. He also developed the 16PF questionnaire, which is still widely used today. So why are we talking about Cattell? It is because Cattell's trait theory enhances the understanding of McCurry and Costa's five-factor theory. Now, let us compare and contrast both Cattell and McCrean Costa's works. Next slide. First, Cattell and McCrean Costa both used an inductive method of gathering data. Other factor theorists have used the deductive method. The inductive method of gathering data is when they begin with no preconceived bias concerning the number or name of traits or types. The deductive method, on the other hand, is when they begin with a preconceived hypothesis in mind before they begin to collect data. Cattell used three different media of observation to examine people from as many angles as possible. This includes, first, a person's life record or L data derived from observations made by other people. Here, other people observe a person and they talk about the person in question from their points of view. Second, we have self-reports or Q data obtained from questionnaires and other techniques designed to allow people to make subjective descriptions of themselves. Here, the person in question answers questionnaires to examine themselves. Lastly, we have objective tests or T-data, which measure performances designed to challenge people's maximum performance. Here, the person measures his intelligence, speed of responding, and etc. to challenge his maximum performance. In contrast to Cattell's, McCray and Costa's five bipolar factors is limited to responses on questionnaires. Bipolar factors meaning that a person could be extroverted or introverted, he may be neurotic or emotionally stable, and so on. Next slide. Cattell divided traits into common traits, which is shared by many, and unique traits, which is peculiar or special to only one individual. He also distinguished source traits from surface traits. Surface traits are personality elements that can be directly observed, while source traits must be inferred through statistical methods. Cattell also classified traits into temperament, which is how a person behaves, motivation, which tells us why one behaves that way, 
and ability, which is how far or how fast a person can perform or behave. Cattell's multifaceted approach yielded 35 primary or first order traits, which measure mostly the temperament dimension of personality, 23 of which are characterized by normal population and 12 the pathological dimension. Cattell's 16 personality factors questionnaire or 16 PF scale is the largest and most frequently studied of the normal traits. The NEO personality inventory of Costa and McCray yields scores on only five personality factors. And now let's discuss the basics of factor analysis. A comprehensive knowledge of the mathematical operations involved in factor analysis is not essential to an understanding of trait and factor theories of personality, but a general description of this technique should be helpful. To use factor analysis, one begins by making a specific observations of many individuals. These observations are then quantified in some manner, for example, height is measured in inches, weight in pounds, attitude in test scores, job performance, rating scales, and so on. Assume that we have 1,000 such measures on 5,000 people. Our next step is to determine which of these variables or scores are related to which other variables and to what extent. And to do this, we calculate the correlation coefficient between each variable and each other, the other 999 scores. A correlation coefficient is a mathematical procedure for expressing the degree of correspondence between two sets of scores. To correlate, 1,000 variables with the other 999 scores would involve to 499,500 individual correlations, which is 1,000 is multiplied by 999 and divided by 2. Results of these calculations would require a table of intercorrelations or a matrix with 1,000 rows and 1,000 columns. Some of these correlations would be high and positive, some near zero, and some would be negative. For example, we might observe a high positive correlation between leg length and height because one is partially a measure of the other. With 1,000 separate variables, our table intercorrelations would be quite cumbersome. So at this point, we turn to factor analysis, which can account for a large number of variables with a smaller number of more basic dimensions. These more basic dimensions can be called traits. That is, factors that represent a cluster of closely related variables. For example, we may find high positive intercorrelations among test scores in algebra, geometry, trigonometry, and calculus. We have now identified a cluster of scores that we might call factor M, which represents a mathematical ability. In similar fashion, we can identify a number of other factors or units of personality derived through factor analysis. Note that the number of factors, of course, will be smaller than the original number of observations. So our next step is to determine the extent to which individual score contributes to the various factors. So we're going to use correlations. Correlation of scores with factors are called factor loadings. For example, if scores for algebra, geometry, trigonometry, and calculus contribute highly to factor M but not to other factors, they will have high factor loadings on M. Factor loadings give us an indication of the purity of the various factors and enable us to interpret their meanings. Now, in order for mathematically derived factors to have psychological meaning, the axis on which the scores are plotted are usually turned or rotated into a specific mathematical relationship with each other. This rotation can be either orthogonal or oblique, but I think and advocates of the five-factor theory favor the orthogonal rotation. The figure shows that orthogonally rotated axes are at right angles to each other. As scores on the x variable increase, scores on the y axis may have any value. That is, they are completely unrelated to score on the x-axis. This next figure is the oblique method, which was advocated by Cattell. It assumes some positive or negative correlation and refers to an angle of less than or more than 90 degrees. The figure depicts a scattergram of scores in which x and y are positively correlated with one another. That is, as scores in the x variable increases, scores in the y axis have a tendency also to increase. Note that the correlation is not perfect. 
Some people may score high on the X variable but relatively low on Y and vice versa. Perfect correlation would result in X and Y occupying the same line. Psychologically, orthogonal rotation usually results in only a few meaningful traits, whereas oblique methods ordinarily produce a larger number. So is the Big Five a taxonomy or a theory? What is a theory? Theories generate research and it can both predict and explain, while taxonomy supply a classification system and are essential starting points for the advance of science. McCurry and Kalsa's work began as an attempt to identify basic personality traits as revealed by factor analysis. They soon evolved into a taxonomy and the five-factor model, and it eventually became a theory. Robert Roger McRae was born on April 28, 1949 in Maryvale, Missouri, a town of 13,000 people located about 200 miles north of Kansas City. Maryvale is home to Northwest Missouri State, the town's largest employer. McRae, the youngest of three children born to Andrew McRae and the Lois Elaine McRae, grew up with an avid interest in science and mathematics. By the time he entered Michigan State University, he had decided to study philosophy. A National Merit Scholar, he nevertheless was not completely happy with the open-ended and non-empirical nature of philosophy. After completing his undergraduate degree, he entered graduate school at Boston University with a major in psychology. Given his inclination and talent for math and science, McRae found himself intrigued by the psychometric work of Raymond Cattell. In particular, he became curious about using factor analysis to search for a simple method for identifying the structural traits found in the dictionary. Nevertheless, McRae's work on traits while in graduate school was a relatively lonely enterprise, being conducted quietly and without much fanfare. As it turns out, this quiet approach was well suited to his own relatively quiet and introverted personality. In 1975, four years into his PhD program, McCray's destiny was about to change. He was sent by his advisor to work as a research assistant with James Fossard. It was Fossard who referred McCray to another Boston-based personality psychologist, which is Paul T. Costa Jr. After completing his PhD in 1976, Costa hired McCray as project director and co-principal investigator for a smoking and personality grant. McCray and Costa worked together on this project for two years until they both were hired by the National Institute on Aging's Gerontology Research Center. Costa was hired as a chief of the Section on Stress and Coping, whereas McCray took the position as a senior staff fellow. Costa and McCray conducted work on traits that ensured them a prominent role in the 40-year history of analyzing the structure of personality. Next is Paul T. Costa Jr. He was born on September 16, 1942, in Franklin, New Hampshire, the son of Paul T. Costa, Sr. and Esther Vasil Costa. He earned his undergraduate degree in psychology at Clark University in 1964, and both his master's in 1968 and Ph.D. in 1970, in human development from the University of Chicago. His long-standing interest in individual Differences in the nature of personality increased greatly in the stimulating intellectual environment at the University of Chicago. Well, he's in Chicago. He worked with Salvatore Armadi, a person whom he published a book on humanistic personality theory, Armadi and Costa, 1972. And after receiving his PhD, he taught for two years at Harvard and from 1973 to 1978, moved to University of Massachusetts, Boston. And at the same year, in 1978, he began working at the National Institute of Aging Strontology Research Center, becoming the chief for the section on stress and coping. And then in 1985, he tries into chief for the laboratory of personality and cognition. The collaboration between Costa and McRae has been unusually fruitful, with well over 200 co-authored research articles and chapters, and several books, including Emerging Lives, Enduring Dispositions, Personality in Adulthood, A Five-Factor Theory Perspective, and Revised Neo Personality Inventory. The study of traits has been going on since then, followed by Cattell, Toops, Crystal, and Norman, and eventually by Costa and McRae in the late 1970s and early 1980s. McCray and Costa built elaborate taxonomies of personality traits using factor analytic techniques 
to examine the stability and structure of personality. They differed greatly from other theorists because others built taxonomies to generate testable hypotheses. Costa and McCurry focused on two main dimensions of neuroticism and extroversion. After they discovered neuroticism and extroversion, Costa and McCurry discovered a third factor, the openness to experience. Most of Costa's and McCurry's work focus on these three dimensions. Next. On 1983, McCurry and Costa were still talking about the three factors of personality. But on 1985, they began to report work on the five factors of personality. This culminated in their new five-factor personality inventory, the NEOPI. NEO representing the three personality factors and the PI as personality inventory. In the 1985 inventory, the last two dimensions, agreeableness and conscientiousness, were still the least well-developed scales until the NEOPIR or the revised NEOPI was published in 1992. Throughout the 1980s, McCurry and Costa continued their work of factor analyzing almost every other major personality inventory, including the Myers-Briggs Type Indicator or the MBTI and the Einstein Personality Inventory. So we have two major and related questions in personality research. One, with the dozens of different personality inventories and hundreds of different scales, how was a common language to emerge? Everyone has individual set of personality traits, and this makes it difficult to compare and accumulate data that would describe traits generally. Second, what is the structure of personality? Cattell had 16 factors, Einstein, three, and others argue that we have five. Fortunately, the five-factor model has provided us with answers to both these questions. Since the late 1980s and early 1990s, most personality psychologists have opted for the five-factor model. The five factors have been found across cultures using large amounts of languages. It also shows permanence with age. Findings prompted McCurry and Costa to write that the facts about personality are beginning to fall into place. Or as McCurry and Oliver John insisted, the existence of five factors is an empirical fact, like the fact that there are seven continents or eight American presidents from Virginia. So these are the five factors that McCurry and Costa introduced. We have openness to experience, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. McCurry and Costa agreed with Einstein that personality traits are bipolar and follow a bell-shaped distribution. So how can people at extremes be described? 1. Neuroticism Neuroticism represents the degree to which a person experiences the world as distressing, threatening, and unsafe. Each individual can be positioned somewhere on this personality dimension between extreme poles perfect emotional stability versus complete emotional chaos. People who score high on neuroticism tend to be anxious, temperamental, self-pitying, self-conscious, emotional, and vulnerable to stress-related disorders. Those who score low on neuroticism are usually calm, even-tempered, self-satisfied, and unemotional. Second, extroversion. Extroversion indicates how outgoing and social a person is. People high on extroversion tend to be affectionate, jovial, Talkative, joiners, and fun-loving. Low extroversion scorers are usually reserved, quiet, loners, passive, and lacking the ability. Third, openness to experience. Openness to experience indicates how open-minded a person is. It distinguishes people who prefer variety from those who have a need for closure and who gain comfort in their association with familiar people and things. People high on openness are generally creative, imaginative, curious, and liberal, and have a preference for variety. People who score low on openness to experience are typically conventional, down-to-earth, conversative, and lacking in curiosity. Fourth, agreeableness. Agreeableness refers to how people tend to treat relationships with others. It distinguishes soft-hearted people from ruthless ones. People who score high on agreeableness tend to be trusting, generous, yielding, acceptant, and good-natured. Those who score low are generally suspicious, stingy, unfriendly, irritable, and critical of other people. Lastly, we have conscientiousness. Conscientiousness describes a person's ability to regulate their impulse control in order to engage in goal-directed behaviors.
People who score high on conscientiousness are hardworking, punctual, and persevering. In contrast, people who score low on conscientiousness tend to be disorganized, negligent, lazy, and aimless, and are likely to give up when the project becomes difficult. Uh, on the following slides, we have tables for the five-factor model of personality. The five-factor model focuses on conceptualizing traits as a spectrum rather than black and white categories. It recognizes that most individuals are not on the polar ends of the spectrum, but rather somewhere in between. To easily remember the five factors, we have ocean or canoe as acronyms for the personality factors. Originally, the five factors constituted nothing more than a taxonomy, a classification of basic personality traits. By the late 1980s, Gost and McRae became confident that they and the other researchers had found a stable structure of personality. That is, they had answered the first central question of personality, which is, what is the structure of personality? This advance was an important milestone for personality traits. The field now had a commonly agreed on language for describing personality, and it was in five dimensions. Describing personality traits, however, is not the same as explaining them. For explanation, Scientists need theory, and that was the next project for McCray and Costa. McCray and Costa objected to earlier theories as relying too heavily on clinical experiences and on armchair speculation. By the 1980s, the rift between classical theories and modern research-based theories had become quite pronounced. It had become clear to them that the old theories cannot simply be abandoned. They must be replaced by a new generation of theories that grow out of the conceptual insights of the past and the empirical findings of contemporary research. Indeed, this tension between the old and new was one of the driving forces behind Cost and McRae's development of an alternative theory, one that went beyond the five-factor taxonomy. According to McRae and Costa, first and foremost, a new theory should be able to incorporate the change and growth of the field that has occurred over the last 25 years, as well as be grounded in the current empirical principles that have emerged from research. For 25 years, Costa and McRae had been at the forefront of contemporary personality research, developing and elaborating on the five-factor model. According to McRae and Costa, 1999, neither the model itself nor the body of research findings with which is associated constitutes a theory of personality. A theory organizes findings to tell a coherent story, to bring into focus those issues and phenomena that can and should be explained. Earlier, McCray and Costa, 1996, had stated that the facts about personality are beginning to fall into place. Now is the time to begin to make sense of them. Well, in other words, it was time to turn the five-factor model or taxonomy into a five-factor theory. The following slides are units of the five-factor theory. In the personality theory of McCray and Costa in 1996-1999-2003, to 2003, behavior is predicted by an understanding of three central or core components and three peripheral ones. The three central components include basic tendencies, characteristic adaptations, and self-concept. The central or core components are represented by rectangles, whereas the peripheral components are represented by ellipses. The arrows represent dynamic processes and indicate the direction of casual influence. For example, objective biography or life experiences is the outcome of characteristic adaptation as well as external influences. Also, biological basis are the sole cause of basic tendencies or personality traits. The personality system can be interpreted either cross-sectionally or as to how the system operates at any given point in time, or longitudinally, or as to how we develop over the lifetime. Moreover, each casual influence is dynamic, meaning that it changes over time. Now let's start with the first core component of personality, which is the basic tendencies. As defined by McCray and Costa in 1986, 
basic tendencies are one of the central components of personality, along with the characteristic adaptations of self-concept, biological basis, object biography, and external influences. McCray and Costa defined basic tendencies as the universal raw material of personality capacities and dispositions that are generally inferred rather than observed. Basic tendencies may be inherited, imprinted by early experience, or modified by disease or psychological intervention. But at any given period in individual's life, they define the individual's potential and direction in earlier versions of their theory, McCray and Costa, in 1996, made it clear that many different elements make up basic tendencies. In addition to the five stable personal traits, these basic tendencies include cognitive abilities, artistic talent, sexual orientation, and the psychological process underlying acquisition of language. In most of the later publications, McCray and Costa 1999-2003 focused almost exclusively on the personality traits, more specifically the five dimensions, the N, E, O, A, and C, described in detail above. The essence of basic tendencies is their basis in biology and their stability over time in the situation. Now let's move on to the second core components of personality, which is characteristics adaptations. The principal difference between basic tendencies and characteristic adaptations is their flexibility. McCray and Costa explained the relationship of the two, saying that the heart of their theory is the distinction between the basic tendencies and characteristics adaptation, precisely the distinction that we need to explain the stability of personality. Moreover, our dispositions and tendencies are the direct influence on our characteristic adaptations. Understanding how characteristic adaptations and basic tendencies interact is absolutely central to the five-factor theory. Basic tendencies are stable and enduring whereas characteristic adaptations fluctuate, making them subject to change over a person's lifetime. The last or the third core components of personality is the self-concept. McCray and Costa explain the self-concept is actually a characteristic adaptation, but it gets its own box because it is such an important adaptation. McCray and Costa wrote that it consists of knowledge, views, and evaluations of the self, ranging from miscellaneous facts of personal history to the identity that gives a sense of purpose and coherence to life. Learning theorists such as Albert Pandura and humanistic theorists such as Carl Rogers or Gordon Alport believe that the conscious views people have of themselves are relatively accurate. With some distortion, perhaps, in contrast, psychodynamic theorists would argue the most of the conscious thoughts and feelings people have of themselves are inherently distorted and the true nature of the self is largely unconscious. However, McCrane costs include personal myth as part of a person's self-concept. In this slide, we'll be discussing the three peripheral components, which are the biological basis, objective biography, and external influences. The five-factor theory rests on single casual influence on personality traits, namely biology. The principal biological mechanisms that influence basic tendencies are genes, hormones, and brain structures. Advances in behavioral genetics and brain imaging have begun and will continue to fill in the details. This positioning of biological basis eliminates any role that the environment may play in the information of basic tendencies. This should not suggest that the environment has no part in personality information, merely that it has no direct influence on basic tendencies. The environment does not influence or does influence some components of personality. This underscores the need to distinguish the main two components of the model the basic tendencies and the characteristic adaptations. The second peripheral component is objective biography, that defines as everything the person does, thinks, or feels across the whole lifespan. Objective biography emphasizes what has happened in people's lives, which is objective, rather than their view or perceptions of their experiences or the subjective. Every behavioral response becomes part of the cumulative record, Whereas theories such as Alfred Adler or the style of life or then Mark Adams, which is personal narrative, emphasize the subjective interpretations of one's life story 
different from a Korean costa because they focus on objective experiences, which is the events and experiences one has had over one's lifetime. The last peripheral component is external influences. People constantly find themselves in a particular physical or social situation that has some influence on the personality system. The question of how we respond to the opportunities and demands of the context is what external influences is all about. According to McCray and Costa, these responses are a function of two things, characteristic adaptations and their interaction with external influences, wrote the two arrows going to the objective biography ellipse. McCray and Costa assume that Behavior is a function of the interaction between characteristic adaptations and external influences. As an example, they cite the case of Joan, who is offered tickets to see the opera La Traviata. The background predicts that Joan is likely to respond the way she did to an offer to attend an opera. So let's now move on to the basic postulates. Note that each of the components of the personality system, except by logical basis, has core postulates. Because the components of basic tendencies and characteristic adaptations are most central to the personality system, and now we will elaborate only on the postulates for these two components. Basic tendencies have four postulates, the individuality, origin, development, and lastly the structure. First is the individuality postulate. It stipulates the adults have a unique set of traits and that each person exhibits a unique combination of trait patterns. The precise amount of neuroticism, extroversion, openness, agreeableness, and conscientiousness is unique to all of us, and much of our uniqueness result from variability in our genotype. The second is the origin postulate. It takes a clear stance. All personality traits are the result of endogenous internal forces, such as genetics, hormones, and brain structure. Irritability addresses the question of what is the difference in the correlation on a given personality trait between individuals who are genetically identical and those who share only about 50% of their genes and in those who share the case of most personality traits are the degree of similarity suggests that about 50% of the variability in personality is due to the heritability or the genetics. The third one is the development postulate. It assumes that traits develop and change through childhood but in adolescence the development slows, and by early to mid-adulthood, a change in personality nearly stops altogether. Finally, the structure postulate. It states that traits are organized hierarchically from narrow and specific to broad and general, just as Isink had suggested. This postulate grows out to McCray and Costa's long-held position that the number of personality dimensions is five and only five. Next is a postulate for characteristic adaptations. The postulate concerning characteristic adaptations states that, over time, people adapt to their environment by acquiring patterns of thoughts, feelings, and behaviors that are consistent with their personality traits in earlier adaptations. In other words, traits affect the way we adapt to the changes in our environment. Moreover, our basic tendencies result in our seeking and selecting particular environments that match our dispositions. For instance, an extroverted person may join a dance club, whereas an assertive person may become a lawyer or business executive. The second characteristic adaptation postulate, small adjustment, suggests that our responses are not always consistent with personal goals or culture values. For example, when introversion is carried to extreme, it may all result in a pathological social shyness, which prevents people from going out of the house or holding down a job. The third characteristic adaptation postulate states that basic traits may change over time in response to biological maturation, changes in the environment, or deliberate interventions. This is McCray and Costa's plasticity postulate, one that recognizes that although basic tendencies may be rather stable over the lifetime, characteristic adaptations are not. For example, interventions such as psychotherapy and behavior modification may have a difficult time changing a person's fundamental traits, but they may be potent enough to alter a person's characteristic responses. Now, let's talk about research as related to the five-factor theory. Traits have been linked to vital outcomes such as physical health, well-being, and academic success, but traits have also been linked to more common, everyday outcomes such as mood. Traits can predict long-term outcomes, but traits can also predict more discrete outcomes.
Number one, personality and academic performance. Relationship between traits and academic performance as measured by standardized test scores and GPA received a fair amount of research. Eric Knopfler and Richard Robbins conducted a study which they measured the traits and academic outcomes of more than 10,000 students. They gave undergraduates self-reported questionnaires to measure their scores on the Big Five traits and gathered their SAT scores and GPAs. They predicted that conscientiousness tend to have higher GPAs. A meta-analysis of 80 studies on more than 70,000 students confirmed the important role that conscientiousness has in GPA. In fact, conscientiousness has nearly the same influence on GPA as intelligence. Which dimensions of the Big Five would you think best predicts a willingness to cheat on tests or copy papers or homeworks? Killock and Postlacuet in 2015 conducted a meta-analysis of 17 studies from all over the world that measured personality using the Big Five and at least one measure of academic dishonesty. Correlations show that scoring low on conscientiousness and agreeableness predicted academic dishonesty. Additionally, the studies found that the Big Five traits were not strong predictors of scores on the math section of SAT, but openness was related to scores on the verbal section. Also, in the discussion of predicting SAT scores from traits, conscientiousness was not a strong predictor as it was for GPA. Next slide. Michael Ziffer and colleagues on 2007 conducted a study to see whether those high on neuroticism were indeed more likely to retake the SAT. The result was that those who scored high on neuroticism were more likely to take the SAT multiple times. The researchers found that scores on the SAT tended to increase over time, so participants in the study tended to score higher the second time than the first and higher the third time they took the test. When it comes to predicting academic performance from traits, the traits that are most important depend on the outcome of the interest because there are multiple ways to do well. Conscientiousness is good for GPA but not that important for the SAT. Openness is great for verbal ability but doesn't matter much for mathematical ability. Aneuroticism is associated with taking tests over and over again and doing better at each time. Another reason Research is about Another research is about traits, internet use, and well-being. Some studies find that daily internet use is associated with higher levels of depression and poorer well-being in teens, while others find no correlation between these variables. Dutch youth van der Aan and colleagues on 2009 reasoned that the internet is not used the same way by all teens, nor does the usage affect all teens in the same way. They sought to examine the contribution of the personality traits of teens to internet usage and the impact that usage has on their well-being. Do more introverted teens turn to internet more for social interaction? And does internet usage differentially impact youth with different traits profile? The researchers surveyed teens via online survey, completed the VIG-5 assessment, and was asked about their internet use, loneliness, self-esteem, and depressive moods. Next slide. The results show that daily internet use in itself is not directly associated with low well-being. Rather, any risks of internet use in terms of well-being are more related to individuals' tendencies to use the internet compulsively, and that they feel that they are unable to surf the internet, that they are preoccupied with the internet, or to have the internet block them from doing other tasks. This compulsive use of the internet was predicted in the study of personality traits and this compulsive use was more strongly predictive of feelings of loneliness and having depressive symptoms. Van der Rijn and colleagues in 2009 hypothesized that these young people may end up in a vicious cycle of ever greater internet use that may become compulsive, setting themselves up for lower well-being. Another research, we have traits and emotions. Traits can affect the mood a person experiences on a daily basis. Researchers have long considered positive emotion to be the core of extroversion and negative emotion to be the core of neuroticism. Questions emerged whether other factors of the Big Five contributed to the positive and negative emotions or other emotional states. Shota, Keltner, and John in 2006 explored the relationships among multiple positive emotions and the core personality dimensions of the Big Five for a more nuanced picture of the relationship between personality and emotion. They asked undergraduate psychology students to rate their experiences of seven positive emotions, which are joy, contentment, pride, love, compassion, amusement, and awe, in a dispositional positive emotion scale. Participants also assessed their scores on the Big Five. 
and their peers rated their personalities. As the study was correlational, many interesting relationships emerged between the participants' self-rating of their positive emotions and their personality traits. And all seven positive emotions correlated with extroversion. Joy, contentment, and pride are related to conscientiousness, while agreeableness to love and compassion. All was related to openness to experience, while neuroticism negatively correlated to all positive emotions. Since most studies are correlational, what has not been clear is whether the trait of extroversion or neuroticism causes the experience of positive and negative mood respectively, or if it is the experience of the emotions that causes people to behave in ways concordant with traits. Murray McNeil and William Fleason in 2006 conducted a study to determine the direction of causality for the relationships between extroversion and positive mood and between neuroticism and negative mood. Since most studies are correlational, what has not been clear is whether the trait of extroversion or neuroticism causes the experience of positive and negative mood respectively, or if it is the experience of the emotions that causes people to behave in ways concordant with traits. Murray McNeil and William Fleason in 2006 conducted a study to determine the direction of causality for the relationships between extroversion and positive mood and between neuroticism and negative mood. They gathered participants in groups of three in two different group discussions. In the first group discussion, they instructed the first person to act extroverted, the second person to act introverted, and while the last one was not instructed at all. In the second group discussion, the first person and the second person switched their roles, the first person now introverted, and the second person extroverted. The third person remained the same. After the discussion, the participants reported higher positive mood when they acted extroverted than when they acted introverted. Regardless of your natural level of extroversion, just acting in an extroverted manner can make you feel better than if you act introverted. McNeil and Thiessen in 2006 investigated the effects for neuroticism and negative mood. They concluded that if you are in a bad mood but want to be in a good mood, act extroverted. Next slide. So we have been talking about how neuroticism and acting neurotic is related to negative emotions, but some recent research suggests that it is not the case that everybody who scores high on neuroticism experiences more negative emotion. There are individual differences for the speed with which people process incoming information, and these differences might influence the relationship between neuroticism and negative mood. In Robinson's and Clore's study, the participants completed a troop test and a computer measured how fast they completed the task. After that, they completed a self-report measure of neuroticism. They were then asked to record their mood at the end of each day for two weeks. The researchers found that neuroticism did predict experiencing more negative mood but only for those who were slow at the computer task. Those who were high on neuroticism but fast at computer tasks did not report any negative emotion. Next slide. The research on traits and emotion shows that although the early research in this area showing that extroversion and neuroticism are related to positive and negative mood respectively is not accurate, traits are not an immutable destiny. Even if your traits predispose you towards certain types of behavior, your actions can subvert those dispositions. And now we'll proceed to the critique of trait and factor theories. Trait and factor methods, especially those of Ising and advocates of the Big Five model, provide important taxonomies that organize personality into meaningful classifications. The trait and factor theories of Ising and Costa and McRae are examples of a strictly empirical approach to personality investigation. A psychometric approach, rather than clinical judgment, is the cornerstone of trait and factor theories. Nevertheless, like other theories, trait and factor theories must be judged by six criteria of useful theory. On this criterion, the R's of Ising and Costa and McRae must be rated very high. The genetic and biological antecedents of behavior are suggested by the two squares on the left, whereas some of the consequences or outcomes of Ising's research are found in two squares on the right. The trait theory of McRae and Costa and the other advocates of the Big Five personality structure have also generated large amounts of empirical research. The extracting factors then provide a convenient and accurate description of personality in terms of traits. The theories of Ising and advocates of the Big Five are each a model of consistency. 
but the two theories taken together are somewhat inconsistent. First criteria is do trait and factor theories generate research? Well, the five-factor model of Isink and Costa and McCray must be rated very high. The trait theory of McCray and Costa and the other advocates of the big five personality structure have also generated large amounts of empirical research. Second, are trait and factor theories falsifiable? Trait and factor theories receive a moderate to high rating. Third, trait and factor theories are rated high on their ability to organize knowledge. Fourth, a useful theory has the power to guide the actions of practitioners and on this criterion, trait and the factor theories receive mixed reviews. Fifth, are trait and factor theories internally inconsistent? While the big five theory and research is internally quite consistent, even if there are some who disagree with the number of basic dimensions of human personality. The last or the sixth is trait and factor theory should receive an excellent rating on parsimony because factor analysis is predicted in the idea of the fewest explanatory factors possible.